we're live for another episode of Food for Thought Live, where we talk about all things celebrity gossip and what people are wearing. Oh, no, hang on. Those are the things we couldn't care less about. Um, so we don't talk about those. We talk about really important things that matter and inspire and empower. And all of the guests that we've had so far, 15 of them, if you can believe that, have all done that uh, in no small measure. And it makes me realize how lucky I feel that these people are people who I've had the privilege of meeting, becoming friends with, and uh, and myself being inspired by and empowered by and just makes me feel so grateful that I've that I've got these people in my life. And that's true of my guest tonight because she's an incredible woman. She has become a friend of mine over the last few years, all the way through animal conservation. Um, we've never acted together, but I hope that that will change. Um, and we'll see what we can do about that. Um, but most of all, what I love about this guest this evening is her utter unwavering passion and dedication to the cause for animal welfare, animal conservation. And with that in mind, it is such an honor and a pleasure to introduce you to Rula Lenska. <laughs> oh, dearest Dan, the honor is all mine. I'm thrilled to be amongst such luminaries as you have spoken about. <laughs> um, icons, icons in my life. And I'm just thrilled to be part of this. Uh, and icons is a good word. To, you are one yourself and in many ways. And and it may, it's, it really does make me feel incredibly lucky and grateful that you that you would take the time to join us and share your story, because I know it's quite incredible. And I know that I don't even know half of it. And <laughs> and, and I love the fact that we've got so much to talk about. And as usual with these conversations, we'll all be really frustrated at having to end it because there's so much more to talk about and we'll just have to go for that walk we talked about having and continue our conversation not to, not to mention some amazing trip when all the lockdown is finished to go and see the beasties in the places yeah. that they're supposed to be absolutely and we will be talking about some of them this evening for sure because what what, what i realized in in talking to ruler about this conversation we're having this evening is that we we're literally going to be doing a, a kind of a world tour in terms of the the charities that Rula supports and the animals that she cares for and the places where those animals are and those charities are. So we'll, we're going to be taking a little bit of a world tour, which is nice considering we're all stuck at home, I think. Um, but how did it all start for you? Because I know you've been an advocate for animals for decades. All and my life, really. All, all your life. And, my and long, long, long life. <laughs> I don't believe it, not for a moment, but... Tell, tell us where, where that passion came from. How, how did you come to love animals so much? Um, well, ordinary domestic, not ordinary, domestic animals I've always loved. I was brought up with Cocker Spaniels. We always had cats when I was living in the country before moving to London. Always had all rescues, dogs mm. and cats. Always wanted more than that, like um, donkeys in particular, but never got round to that. And then many years ago, I think almost from its original inception, Zucek, I got involved with the Born Free Foundation, who have really been my shining beacon of light ever since. So from Zucek to Ellie Friends, where I became properly involved, to rescuing the dolphins from Brighton and sending them off to the Turks and Caicos, to following every single um, rescue that they do, every talk given by Virginia and by Wills and before that God rest his soul beautiful Bill Travis mm. I mean they are they have been as I said a shining beacon for me for always I think Virginia is probably the greatest of my female icons and extraordinarily all the biggest leaders in conservation do seem to be feminine yeah uh, and Fossey, yeah. Jane Goodall Daphne Sheldrick Virginia, of course, Sangeeta, Lek, uh, Cynthia Moss. Um, so many. They've just, you know, they, they started as icons and now a lot of them are close friends and I treasure them enormously. As I'm sure they do you. And um, when you talked about the dolphin release into the Turks and Caicos with Born Free, I think that's the story that Virginia told us. I know you saw that broadcast. Mm -hmm. That's what she was talking about, wasn't it? That incredible release into the wild. I mean, what an incredible journey to follow and a thing to 
to witness well, and be part of. Been incredibly lucky and met probably all the key wildlife animals in the world in their natural habitat. I also managed to swim with wild dolphins off the coast of Australia in 1987 in a place called Monkey Maya, um, where I got married to my ex-husband and we took my mother out there. And as one of the presents from the theatrical company that we were working for, we were taken to Monkey Maya. And I said to my mother that we would be standing in the water interacting with wild dolphins. And she said, that's not possible. It's not possible. I don't believe you. And sure enough, we arrived. I don't know what it's like now, but then it was completely deserted. And we walked into the sea with our children and my mother. And lo and behold, this dolphin with her babies oh. came right up to us, swam in between my mother's legs, and the tears started pouring down her face. Mm. I mean, it could have been an apparition of the Virgin Mary. It was just extraordinary. How incredible. The power that the animals can have over us when we let them in in that way, when we have that connection and allow that connection. I mean, I... Particularly with dolphins, that incredible oh. uh, intelligence. You know, when, you, when they look into your eyes, I don't know whether you've ever had the joy of that, but it yeah. is really like a spiritual communion. Yeah. The, the, that gentle smile on their faces and... Yeah. It's one of the, the things that I will remember to my dying day. There are many, many of them, but that was really extraordinary. I, I, I had the incredible privilege of swimming with wild dolphins in Costa Rica, um, which very suddenly appeared next to a small, but we were actually out whale watching. And, um, and without a moment's thought, because dolphins, I, I have a huge bronze dolphin coffee table over in the corner there, which I've had most of my adult life. I just adore dolphins oh, so and always have. And I, without thinking about it, I just jumped into the water and was very briefly swimming with these wild dolphins. And then as soon as they had arrived, they had vanished. And, and, then, and at that point, I became aware of the fact we were about two miles offshore. The boat had drifted off this way. And I was in the middle of the ocean off Costa Rica, which is very, very uh, abundant with, with marine life. And I suddenly became very aware of my mortality. <laughs> but it was worth it. It was worth it for that moment with the dolphins. And you know, years ago, there was a rogue male dolphin off the Northumbrian coast. I yes. think he was called Freddy. Yes, I remember, I remember this. I was filming out there, I can't remember what it was, some children's series. And my daughter, who was then about 11, came to join me for a long weekend. And the television said it would be great if we could get you out into the ocean and see whether would, Freddy would come and interact with you. Yeah. And this is the North Sea, right? So frigging yeah. freezing. <laughs> and it was, I think, February. So we were all in the dry suits and everything. And my daughter was completely fearless. Um, we went out there in the boat and suddenly Freddie appeared and she was the first into the sea. And Freddie took no notice of me whatsoever, but he was leaping all over and circling my daughter. And she was so thrilled. Yeah. It was... Um, oh, just indescribably wonderful. There's something um, you, you you mentioned, it's a, you know, it being a quite a profound spiritual experience. There's something about dolphins where I've I've heard on good authority that whenever people are in the water, the dolphins will always go for the youngest first. They'll always go and spend time with the youngest and, in my view, the purest of souls. And they'll even spend time with pregnant women because they can hear sense two heartbeats. Yes, I mean. I'm Absolutely certain that's true, and I think that's there's still an enormous amount we have to learn from dolphins and from whales. I mean, their ways of communication, their subsonic sound, the whale songs that are passed on from generation to generation. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary mammals. Absolutely extraordinary. We, we heard about the, um, the, the orca in captivity at, at um, I think, the one in Marine World in Florida that still to this day though though she was caught and captured i think it was um she's in, in fact i know because i've spoken about it at, at public events she's been in captivity slightly longer than i've been alive and she still sings in the dialect that's unique to her family yeah. and what's even possibly more heartbreaking and remarkable is that her mother is still alive and still in the pod oh. at the age of about 90 and it's uh it's just staggering the, the the complexity and the depth of the 
emotion and the sentience and the family bonds and structures within yeah. within the societies of, of, of whales How and dolphins. Have it been known to rescue humans? Absolutely. Architects and sharks, and absolutely. Like Although yeah. I do understand that they can be quite brutal amongst themselves as well, but we yeah. won't go into that. But, um, no. No, but, they yeah. are. Uh, I think probably of land mammals, the closest to dolphins and whales is the unbelievable elephant, which is probably the greatest passion of my life and the animal that I've spent the most time with right. and feel I've got to know. Um, I have three adopted young elephants, right. two of them already out in the wild from the Daphne Sheldry Foundation. And I've visited her many times, both in the nursery and in Savo. And those experiences have just been oh, indescribably, stunningly wonderful. That's Just Bora, that. that's my oldest, who's now wild. Somebody said to me that that's a look of true ecstasy on my face. <laughs> and rightly so. <laughs> rightly so. How beautiful. What an experience. When was this? Oh, that's about 15 years ago, I guess. I was out there with Gary. Sorry to interrupt you, but I know you'll want to see this. Wildlife artist in the world. And he was taking photographs to uh, draw pictures of the elephants out there. So we spent a magical few days at Daphne's nursery where all the tiny babies are. And then we went out to Tsavo to the junior school where the elephants start to learn to become wild again. So Just um, amazing. What, a, what an incredible place and what an incredible job that they do. And, th and they do it continually. To, in such an amazing way, don't they? I mean, they really do such a such an amazing job of. They do. Of they, as you said, the key thing I think, and one of the most beautiful things about it is that they successfully rewild them. Yes. So frequently. I think, to date, I think it's something like two hundred and sixty that have been reintroduced to the wild. Some of them, you know, um, either abandoned or damaged or uh, yeah. in really dire straits physically, that have. Uh, recovered both mentally and physically because elephants are so highly intelligent. It's not just the physical damage, it's the mental damage. Of course. But it's so difficult to overcome in the early days, which is why when they're introduced to the other young babies in the nursery just outside of Nairobi, it's that's when they form their friendships, that's when they start to rely on older elephants who've been there for a while, and that's when they start to regain their confidence and their ability to feel and think and interact as elephants right. yeah absolutely they never yeah they never forget i mean we've i think we've both been incredibly fortunate in having the, the the great privilege of actually being there at the orphanage and seeing the care with which these babies are looked after and mm -hmm. and to put that in perspective a lot of you will probably already know this but they have a carer that will sleep in the stable with them because the, these babies would never be on their own. It would be like leaving a human baby unattended. When, as you say, they've got they such... They never, never wash their coats, their utility coats, so that the smell of the elephants is on them all the time, because obviously it can't be the same keeper all the time. Right, right. But the keepers change the coats so that the elephant get used to the smell. And I remember on the first two occasions going out to Tsavo, where elephants that were already in the wild... Right. would come back into the stockades to welcome new recruits coming from the nursery to make them feel settled, to make them feel comfortable, to make them feel like elephants. Yeah. And they, they bring, wild elephants bring their new babies back to show them to the keepers, which I find so incredibly moving. It's It's... It reminds me of, again, we've already spoken about Virginia and Born Free. It reminds me of the story of Elsa, where the, the connection between the, the, the person and the animal is so strong that they literally want to introduce their family. Yeah. It's yeah. such a beautiful Poli, Poli, thing. You remember that amazing shot with, with Bill and Virginia yeah. when yeah. Went, went to visit Poli Poli in London Zoo, and she just stretched her trunk out to them, which is enough to make you weep. Oh, yeah, that was but, I, I, when we shared that. Can I just share one story which you might not be aware of? During Please the Second do. World War, the Polish, uh, the Second Polish Army Corps adopted a young brown bear 
from a bunch of gypsies, very young. And they took this bear and he became part of the army. So right. he used to sleep, drink vodka, smoke cigarettes, drink beer. <laughs> He used to sleep with the men with no chains or anything like that until he grew into a proper big sized brown bear. Wow. Then they moved into the Middle East and the only way that they could take this bear with them was that he had to have a position within the army so he became a corporal. And he traveled with the army to the Middle East from the Middle East to Italy to the Battle of Monte Cassino and this bear taught itself from observing humans to carry cannonballs to the cannons. Good Lord. So he was actually fighting the war with the people who had rescued him. Then at the end of the war, wow. he came over to Scotland and because they couldn't find anybody to house him, so he was put into Edinburgh Zoo. And every time he heard the Polish language, he used to walk to oh. the bars of his cage with his arms out like that. Oh, good Lord. And finally he died of a broken heart. I mean, this is the sort of thing, isn't it? That I, it, These are the sorts of stories that spread the message and, and try to get under the skin of people who perhaps aren't yet aware of this incredible complexity and depth that animals have and the connection we can share with them. Which, I mean, Every, practically every single animal on earth is in danger of extinction mm -hmm. because of our thoughtless misuse of this planet, which we still fondly imagine is infinite. It's not, its resources are finite. And right. who are we to judge how and what animals feel? You know, people say that the difference between humans and animals is that we have a soul and they don't. How do we know that? Yeah, and it makes you think they've certainly never met some of the animals we've met. Animals feel, I believe, in the same degree. And in fact, I think that they have senses which we have lost or perhaps which we never had. Oh, I just want to share something with you on the screen right now. <clears throat> you can probably see you've, uh, your story has brought one viewer to tears <laughs> about the Polish bear. I mean, what an incredible story. And of course... There are millions of stories just like that of uh, the incredible things that animals have um, have shown to us. And what strikes me more than anything about with whichever animal we're talking about, whether it's a dog, a bear, an elephant, mice, a squirrel, the, is the is the immediate, unquestioned willingness to forgive and trust again if we just love them. I mean, talking about man's best friend, dogs, um, I work for several charities, one being Canine Partners, right. where dogs are trained to look after people who are physically disabled. And apart from the fact that these dogs give the people who they live with, their owners, a completely new and different and brilliant direction in life, but they look after them in such a way that you wouldn't think was possible. For example, helping them to put shoes on, to pull socks up, to empty and load the dishwasher. Um, it is indescribably extraordinary to see the symbiotic relationship between the people and the animals who look after them. In the same way, of course, we know about uh, dogs for the blind, but not right. many people know that there are also dogs for the hard of hearing. And these dogs are taught not to bark. They do everything with touch. And again, it's, I mean, I, I challenge anybody to watch these animals working and not be incredibly moved. And beyond that, to, to go back to your point about people who have the, this strange misguided belief that animals have no soul, to, to think of that kind of level of knowledge intelligence inherent connection and it's i mean it's ex it's just extraordinary as you say it's absolutely extraordinary i mean we talked we, we spoke the other day about peter egan and um he and i spoke um some time ago about and not that we spoke about it on the broadcast but he speaks of the uh the dogs that were rescued from the south korean dog meat 
markets and have since become trained as as cancer sniffing dogs yeah. Yeah. they can literally diagnose cancer before a before medical science can yeah and have successfully done so and you know talking about the horrendous stories in the east i mean the tulin dog festival where they claim for example that the meat tastes better when it's full of adrenaline so the dogs get tortured before they're killed so that their bodies are infused with adrenaline because it makes them taste better i just i just don't understand how humans can do that it's something we've spoken about a, f a fair bit on on a number of episodes is this I think we re most recently spoke about it with Nikki Campbell, and we also spoke about it with Eduardo from the campaign to to ban trophy hunting. It's that the the the, the contrast in the wiring of a brain that would, uh, I mean that that would be the most horrific thing I could ever imagine. Just to just to even think about it is is a is a horror show. To see it would be life changing, life changing, literally for any of us who care. But to actually perpetrate that. To be responsible for that, and not just once, but over and over again, there there has to be something deeply, desperately lacking in that person's chemistry, in terms of well, compassion. Undeveloped, not only lacking, and, oh. and that's where we have a problem, particularly with. I'm not sure whether one's allowed to say it, but places like China, which just don't have the same emotional involvement as we have. Um, I don't know whether you've been there and whether you've ever been to the wet markets, but it is indescribably repulsive. Mm. Um, and the animals are killed and slaughtered without any sort of feeling for them. None. You know, the turtles, meat and, and skin, um, uh, snakes skinned alive and kittens and dogs and everything you could possibly think of. No respect whatsoever. And how does one reverse that? How does one make them see the way that most of us feel in the West? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very worrying and disturbing uh, situation there. And and least not because, you know, to, in in response to your point about how do you reverse that? In mo there are moments of hope. There are moments where we think, okay. That there's something, something shifting. For example, where China banned the ivory trade before we did, and more recently, and I'm mentioning this for a very specific reason for everybody watching, more recently you'll have seen that there's an announcement from the Chinese government that excludes dogs from livestock. The, li the list of livestock now does not include dogs. Dogs are considered to be companion animals. However, I've just seen that the, today the petitions still circulating from Humane Society International and others to ban the Yulin Dog Festival because that's still going ahead despite this recent so-called victory. Oh, darling, what about the bear bile farms? I mean, gorgeous Jill Robinson, who's another one of my icons, who runs uh, Animals Asia. I mean, yeah. they've made extraordinary progress. Absolutely. But how can they claim in the same way that rhino horn is supposedly in some way curative and that the bile from these poor tortured bears is also curative. How does one change that way of thinking? I'm gonna share the, um, while you're talking about Animals Asia, guys, the, you, you, I, you, you've heard us speak um, many times so far about Animals Asia, but just while we're there, let me um, just point you towards their website which is right here in front of you, which is animalsasia.org, because um, it, as Rule is saying, you know, the, the work that they're doing is exemplary. It's incredible. We will soon have Jill Robinson joining us as a guest. I'm very, very honored to say. Um, and um, it's, I, 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 when we spoke with Peter Egan, we, we, we talked about the bear bile industry and that it's arguably the single most cruel and devastating it's act that mankind inflicts upon any animal. I send huge, huge bear hugs to Jill and all her amazing team in China and Vietnam. Likewise, likewise. Thank you for thank you for mentioning them. I mean, they're just they're incredible. And I mean, you, you guys, you know how how these these broadcasts go. We, what we try to do is is pr is provide you with calls to action and ways that you can help without 
necessarily dipping into your pocket. As you can see, dipping into your pocket is always an option and it's always very, very much appreciated by these charities who just can't operate without without the help of people like you, but uh, or us, I should say. Um, but do check it out because, you know, the, the all of these that we'll be sharing, including Animals Asia, have calls to action where you can sign petitions, you can write to MPs and you can lobby for changes in legislation. And And believe it when I tell you that Animals Asia are making incredible progress in that regard. In fact, we'll, and when we have Jill, all, Jill on, we'll hear from her directly on this, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's next year, 2021, is when the, um, the Vietnamese bear bile industry is completely shut down. Please, please, please let that be true. Please. And that's thanks to Jill. Yes. It, 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 it also, having been touched by one imprisoned bear, who, as we know from the previous talk with Virginia, then got in touch with Virginia and said, what do I do? Yeah. And Virginia said, you just start and you then just... it'll happen. And look at it now. It's extraordinary. It really is extraordinary. And it's one of, it's one of many that you support. I know that you, you, you know, we've got a, uh, this is what, again, I love this so much about my guests and you included is that you all do so much. You contribute so much. You, are completely tireless with all this and we've so we've already been to um to sheldrick in africa we've been to, we're now looking at animals asia in asia of course and but right, right here at home you and i are both very proud patrons of the nature watch foundation which is a mm -hmm. you know a lot of people will, will regardless of whether it's children or animals they'll say well, well hang on hang on what about homegrown problems will you handle those too badgers squirrels uh, and also makeup, you know, makeup yep. without yep. cruelty, makeup that is not used on animals, not tested on animals. Um, I mean, I learned an enormous amount from being with Nature Watch about that. I'm going to share on screen while you're talking uh, the um, compassion over cruelty that you were involved in. Tell us about that. Well, I, uh, I'm sure that people know that uh, medicines and makeup and uh, creams and things like that are tested on animals before they are considered to be safe for humans. And I remember being asked on more than one occasion, if your child's life developed, depended on a cure of some sort, would you be anti it being used on animals before it was used on humans? Which is right. a terribly difficult thing to answer. But I don't think anything should be made to suffer for our own good. I mean, now with this ghastly COVID crisis that we're in, I presume that whatever vaccine is in the pipeline will be tested on animals before it gets to us. Yep, no doubt. No doubt at all. And, and, and with that in mind, I've actually said publicly, and I'll say it again, I will, I will be refusing a vaccine or a, treat, or a treatment. I, I just I just can't I can't do it I, because that would just go against everything I stand for. Um, but that regardless of risk. All, aren't all medicines yeah. tested on animals first? Uh, yeah, I think pretty much all of them are. And, and obviously there's a lot of people working very hard, including Peter Egan, um, Ricky Gervais and, and the likes to, to put an end to that, which is going to be a battle because, of course, money's involved. Huge amounts of money are involved, and and that's the problem we're up against. And you know what? I, what I, it's you know that's just part of the problem. Never even mind medicines, but products generally. One of the most staggering things to discover is that you have to be, you have to ensure that something is cruelty free and vegan, because you could buy a vegan product. In other words, it contains no animal product, which has been tested on animals, because that doesn't count as not being vegan. And mm -hmm. So the fact that you actually have to verify both of those things to me speaks volumes, and it and it just says how dis disturbingly lost we've become as a as a species. Because why should anything suffer for, for our benefit? Why should anything suffer for our gain? I think it's agree. You said that at the very beginning. Whether it's animals in captivity for the sake of entertainment, or whether it's animals being experimented upon for the sake of of, of medicine, I think it's what I think it's right, all unforgivable. What right have we got? To Quite. Right. To pain and suffering. You know, while, while we're on here, I know that an enormous amount of people, due to this COVID outbreak, um, you know, pray God it won't carry on forever, but it's certainly going to be around for a while. 
and people who have um, taken dogs and cats rescue situations from places like the Battersea Dogs Home, Dogs and Cats Home, <laughs> just remind them that this is a commitment. It's not just a cuddle factor for when they're feeling lonely, but adopting an animal, having an animal is a lifelong commitment. And I know that these programs are mostly going to be watched by people of the same mindset as we are, but I just really hope that people realize that once this is over and they don't need that comforting, cuddly little thing lying in their arms and that they're just going to give them back to rescue centers. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more wholeheartedly. I think despite the fact that it's very safe to say, as you just mentioned, that probably everybody watching right now is already very much on side with that. But this this will go out and this will this will be immortalized. This conversation will now be available on into the future. And that message, I think, is absolutely crucial. So thank you for sharing it. I think it's uh, absolutely one of the most important things because, again, this it, we spoke about this yesterday. You know, we have this hope that this crazy apocalyptic situation we're in, we're in might drive some kind of a shift towards the positive. And goodness knows it's not going to happen effortlessly. We need to, we need to be beh right behind it, driving that positive shift forward. It won't just take care of itself. And one yeah, of those examples is seeing people. Already, people are already learning. I don't know how long it will last, but they're learning about compassion and about right. empathy. And if that crosses the barriers into the world of animals and into the way that we think how animals should be treated and mm. how much part of this planet animal life is. I mean, can you imagine a world without animals? I wouldn't want to be here. No, nor would I. And I don't want to have to explain to my grandson or him to have to explain to his children and grandchildren that we were around when... Huh, I don't know how, what the percentage is of animals in captivity and animals in the wild, because there is no real wild anymore. There are protected areas, but there is no real wild, is there? It's so, so depleted and, and d diminishing rapidly. Whatever there is, whatever true wilderness areas are left are under serious threat or uh, gone. And as I mean, you say- I believe in America, there are more tigers in captivity than correct. <laughs> than in the wild. World? I believe that there are more, but you don't even have to say the whole United States. I believe that there are more tigers living as pets in backyards in Texas than there are in the wild, just in Texas. Um, it, it, it's just staggering numbers. And of course, there'll be, there'll be people who, you know, just like where, where we heard the, the argument that trophy hunters make against the campaign to ban trophy hunting, there'll be those that say that if they're they're doing the species a favor because they're keeping them safe, they're breeding, but they're not doing it for the sake of the species. They're not ever doing it with a, a view to rewilding. They're doing it for the sake of having a pet that makes them look cool or tough, and it's disgusting. But nature, nature on her own, before we were decimating animals, before we were destroying forests, before we were getting rid of hundreds of plants that could right. heal and mend all sorts of illnesses, Nature every so often, whether it was a tsunami or a volcano or a, um, a, a drought or fire or whatever, right. would cope with numbers that weren't able to survive in the areas that there are. And still now, with all our technological advancement, when nature decides to strike, we have no power whatsoever. This COVID example is a perfect example. A tiny, minute, little microscopic germ, which has brought the world to its knees. Absolutely, and you would hope, wouldn't you, that that would be somewhat humbling. And 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 that the thing that worries me, and the reason why I think these kind of conversations are so important, and the more than that, the ripple effect that you guys watching can have, the reaching out to other people, and and planting the seed, just spreading these messages. That's why I think it's so important because. If, if what, as you just described beautifully, is what's brought the world to its knees, and, and by, by that I, of course, mean the commercial world um, to its knees, if that's not enough to, to humble us, what, whatever will be. And, and so that's what makes these messages all the more important. The world has been screaming out for help for a yeah. long, long time. 
Yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, even if it's all only a small percentage of the powers that be, of, of the people who can make a difference and, can, and who can turn tides, that they will realise. Absolutely. I hope, I hope you're right. And it looks like there's a couple. I'm not so sure we've got one, but it looks like there's a couple out there. Um, what I wanted to just draw you guys' attention to, Sasha has very kindly put a, a, a link uh, or at least a, a, a message up, which I'm sharing on the screen now, to check out the Ethical Consumer magazine if you want to know about companies you buy from. Now, this comes back to a comment that was made. Forgive me if I, I can't see the comment anymore because there's a lot of comments, which is wonderful. Your engagement is always so appreciated. But somebody mentioned that you have to look at the companies as well. It's not enough to just look at the products, and that's absolutely right. And what I wanted to say, as well as sharing Sasha's point here about the Ethical Consumer magazine, is to share with you the Nature Watch Foundation website for the simple reason that Nature Watch creates what's called the Compassionate Shopping Guide. And so they've done a lot of this work for us. So when it comes to understanding the companies and what they're involved in, because simply put, what good is it buying a cruelty-free product if other products produced by the same company are subjected to animal experimentation or cruelty? Um, and that's a great point. The, the, the Compassionate Shopping Guide, which has been created by Nature Watch Foundation, actually has the most stringent criteria of all in terms of being part of that guide requires the, the parent companies to also be assessed and to reach and meet the criteria. And that means no animal testing. So the old school uh, example of it was when the body shop was supposed to be cruelty free and then it was bought, I think it was L'Oreal that bought the, the body shop and they were involved in animal testing. So no, very good I, point. But my eyes were opened to the amazing huge names in the cosmetic industry, which are still right. guilty of testing on animals. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something else, guys, which well, which actually just as an aside, because or very much related, but just occurred to me because of what Ruler said. When I was in Los Angeles uh, last year, I had, in fact, I was there with Giles filming for Food for Thought before the world was on its knees. Um, and uh, we went to an event which was um, the guest of honor was Paul Mitchell or uh, John Paul DeJuria is his actual name, but he's the guy that is Paul Mitchell, in other words, the hair products that you all know in the, uh -huh. white, in the white containers. And Paul Mitchell, who's now a billionaire with a B, um, he's one of the most successful businessmen on earth, and he is 100% cruelty-free. And the reason why Paul Mitchell exists, as in the product range exists, is because he, when he first started working in the industry, he questioned it, just like you just, just then, Ruler, when you, you said you had your eyes open to it. And he did too. And he was just low, a low-ranking staff member and said, surely we could do it a different way. This can't be right. We can't possibly harm all these animals just for the sake of testing shampoo or whatever it may be. And they said, oh, yeah, no, no, that's, that's the way it is. That's what we do. And that's why he then subsequently left. And obviously the short version of the story is you now have Paul Mitchell hair products. So that's a product that you can rest assured is cruelty free, and um, and that's and a great story behind how the, the company came to be in the first place. So um, Nature Watch Foundation, Compassionate Shopping Guide, the Ethical Consumer Magazine. Your eyes will be opened, I promise. Yeah, please, guys, do you know just? I mean, you know, Ruler is uh, an ambassador for wearing cruelty free makeup, and who could imagine a more beautiful, glamorous individual? <laughs> I love you, Dan. Richardson. Love you too. I love you too. <laughs> should we end it there, or should we carry on? <laughs> Can we have a little, a little chat about my recent trip last year to? Oh, please. Um, Thailand. I would. I was hoping you might say that. <laughs> Let's do that. Well, tell us about it. I was asked whether I'd be interested in going over to Thailand to visit a bona fide, proper elephant sanctuary. Um, and I did, in fact, pass it by Dan before I agreed to go, because I know that he's hugely knowledgeable about the people in the business. And he said that he knew Lek well. And so this was 10 days of the most beautiful time in Thailand, which I'd been to before. That's me with Lek, this little firecracker of a lady, <laughs> tiny, she only just came up to my shoulders. <laughs> and um, she has this extraordinary place outside of Chiang Mai where she has rehabilitated elephants who were either used in circuses or street begging or logging 
whatever, some of them physically abused, some of them mentally abused, some of them both. And here they are just free to be elephants, to free their, uh, to make their own associations with other elephants. They are not shackled, they're not ridden, they're not exposed to tourists. You can walk with them at a distance, but you don't interact with them at all, apart from I was lucky enough to be with Lek. And when we arrived in this little area with these six female elephants had not yet been integrated with the rest of the herds, as we got out of the little golf cart, these elephants ran towards us, every single one of them, just wanting to be as close to Lek as possible. Uh, I was in tears within five minutes, but it was such <laughs> a privilege. And sitting next to her, talking about her projects and how this had all started and um, the general situation with wildlife in Thailand, these elephants were scrambling all over us. And at one point, I had my head right in the elephant's mouth. I never felt a moment of fear because Lek was with me. But um, there we go. Uh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Just Isn't that incredible? <laughs> look at the, the look of utter calm and gratitude on your face as well. Oh, just um, that gentle creature. Such, yeah. such a privilege. And they are such extraordinary, magnificent, gentle giants. Beautiful. Absolutely extraordinary. And, and you rightly sing Lex praises. Lex is, a, mo most of you will know her, of course. She's a absolute world-class animal hero who as you say she's a firecracker she's she's tiny but her spirit and her drive and determination it's she's... extraordinary and and the um she was brought up in the jungle with her family and her father was i believe a shaman so she from a very early age had yeah. uh, extraordinary ways of communicating with animals and elephants in particular and she just decided that this was going to be her life's work rescuing animals from being abused in in logging situations, in circus, in begging, whatever, and just allowing them the dignity to be elephants. And some of them, some of them are blinded. Some of them have had their ears torn to shreds with the ankus, the bull hook. Some of them have got broken hips, broken knees. But here they're treated with the most amazing compassion. Each one has its own keeper, and they just trundle around eating and. Um, interacting with the elephants that they've chosen to be friends with and they're not utilized for tourists I mean you can come there and you can see them from a distance but um, I mean obviously I was incredibly lucky so I'm not the best advertisement for tourists not interacting with them right but you were there as an ambassador as, as and yeah. someone who was going to be a spokesperson for the elephant nature park which by the way the, the, the um, web address there I've put right at the bottom of the screen you'll be able to you'll be able to visit that and take take a look for yourselves and it's an incredible place and as ruler says it's a true sanctuary and i will you know i will say that i've i've met lek in person and she i in fact i did so when i was hosting a screening of love and bananas and love and bananas is a film about that follows the story of lek rescuing one of the elephants and it is quite extraordinary if you haven't already seen love and bananas please go find it check it out you'll probably find it just by doing a simple google search i tried to find it before the broadcast tonight but but i couldn't and i apologize for that but do look for love and bananas because it will show you the, the story of one such rescue that will tell you everything you need to know about lek and the elephant nature park it is absolutely as ruler says a true sanctuary and just a haven of peace and tranquility for these beautiful animals and when, when travel is once again allowed, I mean, what we as uh, tourist visitors, we have a huge responsibility in reporting anything that is untoward, anything that looks like um, maltreatment of an animal. It's up to us as people who visit these places to report. And I think that's a very important thing. So you don't go to places where elephants are are ridden and made to perform for humans. Yeah, quite right, quite right. I mean, and we, we talked about this again in in previous broadcasts, with in particular with Peter Egan, who I know you 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 know and love as much as as the rest of us. And you know, we spoke about the fact that under no circumstances 
will you be allowed to see the cruelty that goes on behind the scenes in order to permit you to ride an elephant so even if it looks like everything's calm and gentle and it's all decorative and everything's supposedly lovely the only reason that's the case is because the animal has been literally beaten to within an inch of its life until it has nothing left to give other than obedience and, and so that's spirit is broken i mean way back in the 90s yeah. uh, when i didn't realize i just thought that elephants and their mahouts their keepers their trainers just had this wonderful friendship symbiotic relationship that like a dog yeah. and a human is developed through yeah. trust and treats and stuff like that it's only when i realized that the spirit of the elephant and the its power its strength and don't forget it's five to six tons has right. to be completely obliterated before they can be put into service. I mean, an elephant is a dangerous animal. Absolutely. And once I'd seen how the elephant is broken, right? I mean, I would never go anywhere near uh, riding an elephant or anything like that again. Yeah. It is it's... just indescribably horrendous. And here, yes. let us go on to another extraordinary woman, Let's... Sangeeta in India, who has also made an extraordinary film called Gods in Shackles, where elephants that are used for religious festivals, um, beautifully decorated with jewels and howdahs and paintings, etc., right. etc., et how they are abused, how they are injured, how they are threatened, how they live in permanent fear from human beings. Um, it just makes you ashamed sometimes it really does and i remember you came very uh, very kindly to the um to the screening that we hosted in london of, at the rgs of gods in shackles and it's a tough watch guys i'm not going to lie to you it's a tough watch um in fact i'm not and i'm not going to play it of course because um it, i don't want to i don't want to put you through it without your permission however i'm going to show you the the website for gods in shackles and by the way sorry just to go back giles my dear friend as you all know and love he has shared the link for love and bananas and i think Maisie tucker has as well um but i didn't i wasn't entirely sure what that link was so but you'll find that i put it on screen and in the comments right there on itunes apple itunes you'll find the link to love and bananas it's an incredible film and well worth a watch and it talks about lex story that ruler you mentioned that you know she some of her family background a part of that story is that she was disowned by much of her family and community because of the fact that it's so deeply ingrained in the culture there that it's it's accept, very much accepted and lots of people make their livelihood from it and she stood against all of that and still went ahead and created the elephant nature park and to this day is still ostracized from many of the people that she grew up with because of it but that's just how much passion and love she has for the animals and as you quite rightly said ruler uh, Sangeeta Iyer, uh, again, we're both a very proud patrons for Voice for Asian Elephants Society. Um, this is probably the perfect time to tell you that um, I'm very, very proud to bring to you um, as my guest on Saturday, Sangeeta Iyer. So it's a perfect, perfect opportunity to mention that. So she'll be with us on Saturday at 7 p.m. So do join us for that. And you'll hear directly from her, the passion she has for these animals. And another example, Ruler, of what, exactly what you just said about Lek, someone who has absolutely dedicated her life to the, to the protection of animals. And this film was an incredible labor of love. And um, as I said, I'm not going to play it to you because even in, the, even in the trailer, in fact, it was this trailer that made me host a screening in, in the Royal Geographical Society. I was invited to a screening which was due to take place in Edinburgh, which of course Winnie that's watching will be aware of. That's how we know each other. Um, and I was due to be a guest and subsequently uh, Sangeeta had a, a, an injury which prevented her from traveling and couldn't come. So rather than postpone it, I said, Let, please allow me to host a screening in London. We'll get more people to it. Ruler, you were there, um, as were many of the, the wonderful uh, friends and family within the community that we, uh, that we love so much were also there. Watching this trailer was enough for me to say it has to happen. Born Free very kindly co-hosted it with me and um, and all the money went to the cause, the Voice for Asian Elephants Society and, and the Born Free Foundation and all the work that they do to protect these incredible animals. And it's like you said, Ruler, these animals, 
uh, they have the, again it's it, it reminds me of when we spoke about the bear bile issue the this is a lifelong and these elephants live a long life too this is a lifelong 60 years yeah absolutely and it's just horrendous and gods in shackles exposes that in no uncertain terms and she has sangeeta has made incredible ground in india which is not easy you know it's really not easy um and she has she has achieved legislative change she's achieved legal uh, support the police force now have wildlife Local teams support, which is so important you know yeah. to get the, it's the same with Daphne Sheldry to get children educated to get people yeah. educated to realize that the elephants are um, emblematic of those countries and that alive and well they are what pulls the tourists to this country not dead elephants but live beautiful elephants being yeah. elephants absolutely absolutely it's um it's quite um it's quite extraordinary the 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 number of things that we have to talk about because of the number of issues that are out there the number of species which is basically all of them uh, we were talking before we went live but we 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 don't think the mosquito is under a great deal of threat but other than that i think pretty much every animal is uh, is being exploited in absolutely everything and wiped out by humans and this this is no exception the ele the elephants and and speaking of uh, india we of course had the um the situation with avni some time ago avni for anyone who doesn't know was a, a female tiger a mother with two young cubs and um she was accused of being a man eater which of course was just a completely spurious claim and i and i learned a lot about the pr the processes and the realities in india and what actually constitutes a man eater and it's not enough for a, uh, a a tiger can actually eat if a guy dies in the forest the farmer just happens to fall hit his head and die the tiger eats that man that tiger is not a man eater to be a man eater it requires the tiger to actively uh, yeah to stalk and attack human prey um and and to do so consistently and there was no proof of this particular tiger having done any anything like that um but they they gave they credited her to, with 13 human deaths um which uh, and there were no dna tests to prove that that was the case there was no actual evidence whatsoever and they just sent out a uh, a hunter to uh, to kill her leaving her two cubs absolutely to fend for themselves which we all knew would eventually end in their demise which it did um and they were supposedly hit by a train at the same time so the corruption is absolutely rife and you ruler very very kindly came and lend, lent your voice oh, to the so moving i remember i remember it oh. so what we we had a silent protest outside the uh, the indian high commission in london do you remember the the staff coming out and photographing us all yeah. i don't know if you've tried for an indian visa the since windows up at the top as well yeah i mean very i think we we rattled a few the cat, the cubs. I'm, I'm afraid to say. Um, some, some weeks later. So, so again, when I say I learned quite a lot about the, the, the realities of the situation, um, there was a whole bunch of propaganda su suggesting that the cubs were at the age where they'd be self-sufficient. They were actually nine months old, and a, and a tiger cub doesn't become self-sufficient and, and dependent on its mother until it's 18 months old, 12 to 18 months old. So they were way short of being, uh, being independent and. Um, and that was just being sold to the to the people to 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 not stand up against this uh, this hunting, which was successful. Subsequently, the cubs were the, the 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 animal conservation groups tried to track the cubs, um, and unfortunately, um, with the little success they had, ended with them finding them both dead by the side of a railway track, suggesting that the same train had hit both cubs and you imagine a tiger and how nimble and agile they are and how fast they are the chances of one being hit by train okay but two and in the same place i'm quite certain that they were just killed and they placed the bodies by a railway track so that they didn't have to deal with the public outcry because it was huge related to avni it was yeah. huge and it was and, and rightly so tens of thousands of people took to the street in cities all, all across india to protest against this so one of the things that that leads me to say is the fact that you know, when we talk about China, we talk about Vietnam, we talk about Thailand, India, all these places where we, and, and of course here and in the United States, wherever we talk about where, where there are problems, there are also really wonderful people. I mean, there are such wonderful organizations and people putting their voice behind these, these campaigns and these, these battles to save these animals from the, the cruelty. But 
but you know, for the most part, the most important contingent, contingent of people is on site in the actual countries. You know, whenever we go to receptions here and it's full of wonderful people who want to make a difference and who donate money, but it's the people in Africa, in China, in India, that's where, you know, the, the changes have to happen at root level. That's why Virginia and Daphne used to stress the importance of teaching the new generation, teaching the children respect and love and the fact that the earth belongs as much to animals as it does to us. We were not put here to control the animals. We were put here to share. So beautifully put. And I'm really, really happy to tell you through a really strange and lovely set of uh, coincidental circumstances, a, a, a guy that I was in a theater production with many years ago, he's now a deputy head teacher at a school. And of course, schools are having a really strange time right now um, with lesson plans and it's all online. And on Thursday, I'll be speaking to a class of children in his school about animal welfare and conservation. And I want you guys to know this because it says so much about the charities. In the last 24 hours, I've asked Born Free, David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation, Nature Watch that we've spoken about tonight, and um, for goodness sake, one more, which I can't remember, it will come back to me. I've asked them if they would be kind enough to provide oh, the Good Heart Animal Sanctuary, who we first interviewed in the very first episode, all of them have, have come forward with educational learning resources, um, with, with project plans, with various different educational tools to help children learn, whether it's Nature Watch with the, the Badger Protection in the UK or the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation with the elephants and the wonderful work that Born Free are doing and Good Heart with their rescued farm animals, all of them within the space of a 24 hour period have just come straight back to me with reams and reams of paperwork that I can, or, and presentations and child friendly, you know, really nice visuals for, for getting, getting children engaged in these issues. So what struck me as being a good idea to, to talk about, just the reason I wanted to mention that very briefly is that any connections you have, and this is tonight's call to action, any connections you have with a school, with a teacher, with young relatives, friends of yours who have young children of school age, let's find ways to, connect with them and engage these animal charities because if we can instill compassion in these kids on the way up half of the problems we're talking about right now won't be a problem anymore yeah. so i think i think that's a really um great point you make about the, the importance of education and all of the people we've been talking about tonight do such a, an incredible job of that don't they oh god they do they and really they do. all dedicate their lives to this passion and compassion and empathy and they make a huge difference and we do what we can to support them and to spread the word and to spread awareness um but as you so rightly said you know that we mostly turn in a circle of like-minded people who right. all feel the same but it's to spread that knowledge further apart to, to to make people realize and i'm really hoping that this ghastly apocalyptic time that we're going through now where we are in a way imprisoned, where we have lost a certain amount of our freedom, that it will just make us realize more <clears throat> what it's like for animals who have no voice. Right. We have to be their voice. They have no choice, but we do. It's so, it's so beautifully put and it's so true. And I just want to draw your guys' attention to two things. Elizabeth has just made this wonderful comment saying she would happily go to local schools with presentations. Thank you for that beautiful comment. I think that's wonderful. And what I also want to draw your attention to is the comment I had up previously from our wonderful Joanne at Born Free, who's, uh, in, uh, as, as per the, the comment you'll see on your screen now, welcomes you guys to reach out to Born Free for any resources. Please, please do, because I can tell you from personal experience, they are fantastic resources. And, um, and it really is the key. I see a lot of comments coming through. Education is the only way forward. Education is the key. Please, please, let's do this because I think this is the this really is the the probably the single most important call to action we could we could ever impart. You know, we talk about petitions and we talk about all of the various things we can do and even donating, but education that really is the most important. I think the single most important one. So collective effort on that front would be quite incredible. Let's make that our our, our aim. 
talking of lifetimes dedicated to animal welfare and conservation ruler you are an absolute shining light and i would love to be able to do more and uh, you know getting to the age where one's got to and particularly now when travel is going to be so much more difficult i hope that there are still several years left and i look forward to doing a trip with you to somewhere extraordinary where we can share our yes. experiences and pass it on to younger people absolutely 100% we will be doing that and we will of course we be sharing with you guys watching some of the the stories from that trip so uh, watch out for that because as soon as it's permitted we are making plans now one of my goosebump moments of my entire life was at that Arvni protest that we just talked about. It was a silent protest. Um, I felt that that would be more poignant at the time because it was it, we were mourning the loss of Arvni at that point. Um, but for anyone who was there, you'll you'll know that there was it was a very emotional. It was it was quite beautiful, really. I mean, it was right in the centre of London on Aldwych. It's, we were just off the off the main road, <clears throat> right in the centre of London, and it's you know a very crazy hustle and bustle noisy place and we managed to find this spot where it was just kind of, it just felt kind of calm and respectful and ruler came along and did something that if anyone wasn't already in tears they were by the end of it and um it was it gave me goosebumps at the time and it still does now so we're going to end tonight in a slightly different way and so i normally say to you guys at the end i say a big thank you to our guest uh, which I'm about to do, and then I say goodbye and I close the broadcast. But tonight, um, I'm going to say my big thank yous to Ruler, and then I'm going to hand over to Ruler. And when Ruler's finished, I'm going to end the broadcast without saying another word because I don't think there's anything I could say that would have more weight, power, beauty, truth, and everything good that you'll hear from Ruler right after this. Um, so that's how tonight's going to end, and I think it's quite an incredible idea which it was rulers and uh i'm so grateful to you for that and for being here um you're an amazing you were, you really are you're an amazing advocate you're a beacon of hope for people because and you you do so much and we're so grateful to you thank you and i'm so grateful to you for having involved me in your uh in your amazing series of guests and i can't wait to carry on listening to the next however many is it that you've still got to go you've done there's 16 quite, so far there's 16 so far and there's a there's a there's probably as many that we've not yet had on and there's people okay. approaching me directly now with with requests to be on it so um i think we're going to be going on for quite some time we maybe will we, maybe we'll relax it down to one a week and i have a feeling it will be going on for most of this year and who knows who knows from there because we you know when we get free to travel maybe we'll do some from on the road maybe we'll We'll take can it I on the ask you, When I do my tiny little farewell contribution, can we end it on a picture, not of me, but of an elephant? Of course we can. Of course we can. Um, and while I while I bring a, a picture of an elephant up, in fact, how about how about the picture of the the elephant with your head in its mouth? <laughs> Absolutely, whichever you that want. That would be quite apt, wouldn't it? Let's have a look. Because I mean, that's I think that's just such a poignant beautiful moment let's just get that full screen and share it for a moment and guys as i say right after ruler's finished speaking i'm going to end the broadcast so i want to thank you in advance for joining us again and for making this such a special uh, event and your engagement is always so appreciated it's so important to us and it's so powerful and we're going to go and make a, a difference in the world with the education thing let's do that together um ruler once again before i hand over to you thank you so much it's just such an honor to have you it's such a such a privilege and you're you're a a, a shining light as i said the privilege is all mine and, and I, I i love and you are wonderful well i love you and i'll see you soon for a walk in the park okay absolutely over to you whenever you're ready If all the beasts were gone, my child, man would die from a great loneliness of spirit. The earth does not belong to people. People 
belong to the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. And whatever he does to that web, he does to himself. All things are connected, like the blood that unites one family. All things are connected. <laughs>